Hello and welcome to the Plus Podcast. I'm Marianne Freiberger. And I'm Rachel Thomas. What's that noise? What, this? Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just shuffling some cards. It's just a little skill I picked up when I was interviewing the fantastic magician Will Houston for this podcast. Will is a professional conjurer and also magician in residence at the Centre for Performance Science at Imperial College London and the Royal College of Music. Mm, well, that's really impressive and it's a great job to have, I imagine. But what's it got to do with maths? Well, I spoke to Will about shuffling cards after watching a fantastic lecture by Cheryl Prager, who's Professor of Mathematics at the University of Western Australia, where I used to go. Cheryl was visiting the Isaac Newton Institute here in Cambridge and gave a lecture about the maths of shuffling cards. In this podcast, we'll hear from both Cheryl and Will as they tell us all about the maths and magic of card shuffling. And as usual, we'll try to explain some maths in just one minute. Okay, actually, I'll come clean. That's not actually me shuffling the cards. That's actually a recording of Will doing what is called a perfect shuffle. Here he is to describe it. The thing that people most commonly think of as being a perfect shuffle uh, would be splitting the pack of cards precisely in half, so that there's 26 cards in each half, uh, and then pushing the two halves together such that the cards alternate one, 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 all of the way through the pack. Uh, You can then do that in two ways. Uh, You can do uh, an out shuffle, which magicians would call an out pharaoh, uh, which will keep the top and the bottom cards consistent. Uh, Or you can do an in pharaoh, which would be an in shuffle, I think, uh, where the top card and the bottom card are moving one card down or up into the uh, final order um, based on their starting positions. So for a perfect shuffle, you split the puck exactly in two and perfectly interleave the two halves. So that's top card from the first pile, top card from the second pile, next card from the first pile, next card from the second pile, and so on. For an out shuffle, you put the top half of the puck as the first pile, so it provides the top card of the shuffled puck. And the bottom half will then provide the bottom card of the shuffled puck. Meaning an out shuffle fixes the top and the bottom cards in their places in the puck. And if you switch your piles, so it's the bottom half of the puck as the first pile, and the top half of the, as the second pile, and then interleave the piles in the same way, you get the other type of perfect shuffle, which is called an in-shuffle. After an in-shuffle, the top card of the original puck has moved down one place, and the bottom card has moved up one place in the shuffled puck. Now, as you'd expect, Will has amazing physical control over the cards, and he can do some amazing different types of shuffles. You can see a video of him in action doing a perfect shuffle on our website, plus.maths.org, and many examples of his excellent card skills on his website, drhouston.co.uk. He can even do a variation of a perfect shuffle where instead of interleaving the cards one at a time, one, 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 he can use a couple of steps to interleave them two at a time instead. His control of the cards is absolutely incredible. So we asked Will what a magician might do with such incredible shuffling skills. So there are all sorts of different things that you could do. Um, For example, if there was a trick where you had the cards in a particular order at the beginning, and not that a magician would ever do such a thing, but if you were doing such a thing, uh, you might want to make people think that you'd mixed up the pack uh, when in fact you hadn't. Uh, And if you do eight of these perfect shuffles in a row uh, and they're the out ones, the ones that keep the top and the bottom card the same, uh, then remarkably, at least as far as my mind is concerned, probably quite straightforwardly as far as you're concerned, uh, the deck ends up going back to its original order after eight repetitions of those out shuffles. Uh, So it admittedly would take quite a long time. But if you wanted somebody to think that the deck was well mixed at the beginning of a trick, uh, you could give it eight of these shuffles. Somebody would then be, I think, 100 percent certain that the cards were mixed because they've seen you mix them quite a lot uh, by that point. But in fact, you would have your order ready to go for something later on. I suppose magicians are very interested in any way that you can make something impossible seem to happen. Uh, and knowing what's likely to happen to a pack of cards when it gets mixed up is part of that. And if you were, what about other people who might say card players, 
if they were trying to cheat at cards? Could you use your control of a deck of cards to to win at a game of cards, for example, if you were dodgy and cheated? Yes, not not that I ever would, um, but I'm sure that one could. Uh, for example, if you were playing in a game of cards with four people, uh, and so you're going to deal around the hands of cards, sort of first person, second, third, fourth, and so forth, uh, and you had a couple of cards which were quite good on the top of the pack, uh, let's say you have a couple of aces or even three aces uh, on top, if you then gave the cards to imperfect shuffles, so two in faro shuffles in magic terms, uh, the first one is going to move those aces to the second position, the fourth position, the sixth position, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then the second of the perfect shuffles is going to move them to the fourth position, the eighth position, the twelfth position, the sixteenth position. So if you did those two shuffles in a row and then dealt out those four hands of cards, uh, you in the fourth position, as you traditionally deal, would end up with whatever the cards on top had been before the shuffling. We became interested in shuffling last year when we saw Cheryl Prager's Kirk lecture at the Isaac Newton Institute. You can watch her lecture online, which is what we did because the pandemic had already started by then. You can watch it by going to their website, newton.ac.uk, and search for shuffling. We spoke to Cheryl after she returned to Australia to ask her more about why mathematicians are interested in shuffling. I'm a, a group theorist interested in symmetry, and I think about the various orderings of the cards in the, in the pack. So if I think that the first ordering that I start out with, it just goes from 1 up to 52 or 1 up to 12, depending on how many cards I've got, then I might, might want to know where each of these cards could lie um, after different combinations of the shuffles. And so each um, outcome is like a, a reordering or a, a permutation of the, of the cards in the pack. And I want to know how many different ones they are. Perhaps I not only want to know how many there are, but what kind of structure is this whole set of reorderings, this permutation group that I've got. So Cheryl thinks of the pack of cards not really in terms of their face value and their suit, which is what we normally do when we play card game, but she thinks of them in terms of their position in the original pack. So if you have a pack of 52 cards, Cheryl labels each card 1 to 52 by its position and then looks at the possible reorderings or permutations, as mathematicians call it, of these 52 cards you get if you use different combinations of in and out shuffles. And mathematicians are not just interested in a pack with 52 cards. They're generally interested in what happens when you have a different size pack of cards as well. The only thing to remember is that the pack always has to have an even number of cards so that you can split it exactly into two equal piles. Mathematics allows you to explore all the possible reorderings you can create using any combination of in and out shuffles, and it produces something called a permutation group. So we are restricting ourselves just to those permutations of the cards that you can get by using any combination of those two perfect shuffles, the in shuffle and the out shuffle. So that might be just one of either of these, or three in shuffles followed by an out shuffle, any combination that you can think of of these two types of shuffles. The set of permutations of the pack of cards that you get from combinations of in and out shuffles is called the shuffle group. Mathematicians have learned a great deal about the shuffle group and an intriguing early result in this area was proven by mathematicians Percy Diaconis, Ronald Graham and William Cantor in the 1980s and it was that every possible permutation in a shuffle group had a property called central symmetry. A very beautiful um, property they, they saw and explained was that the pack has got a, something they called central symmetry. And it's not completely obvious what that means. So um, it's supposing you had 12 cards and you think of the top and the bottom card as being associated then after any sequence of um, shuffles, if suppose the top card went down to the third position, then the bottom card would come up to the third last position. There's this sort of symmetry that whatever um, one of the pair does, the other one mimics it. So the pairs get sort of shuffled around together. 
So they, it's like they've got some invisible bonds connecting them. Whereas a, um, a, a completely random shuffle, not one of these perfect ones, wouldn't have that property at all. So the symmetrical pairs of cards, the pairs that are located the same distance around the centre of the pack, are linked and they always get moved together by the in and the out shuffle. This central symmetry property puts some real restrictions on the possible shuffles you can have in your shuffle group. And in the 1980s, the mathematicians Diaconis, Graham and Cantor looked at the implications of this central symmetry property. And they showed that for most packs of cards that have really giant shuffle groups, and that's relative to the size of the pack, because remember that we're looking at packs of all sorts of sizes. And typically the size of the shuffling group grows exponentially with the size of the pack. So, for example, if you have a pack of six cards, you have 24 possible permutations in its shuffle group. For a pack of 10 cards, you already get 1920 permutations in the shuffle group. And for a pack of 26 cards, you get over 25 trillion different permutations in the shuffle group. These numbers demonstrate that the size of the shuffle group grows exponentially as you increase the size of your pack of cards. But a really amazing thing happens when the size of the pack is a power of two, which mathematicians call the power case. A 14 card pack has over 320,000 permutations in the shuffle group, but a 16 card pack, remembering 16 is two to the power of four, has just 64 possible permutations. That's 320,000 for 14 cards and 64 for 16 cards. We said a 26 card pack has trillions of possible permutations using the in and out shuffles, but a 32 card pack, again, 32 is two to the power of five, has just 160 possible permutations. So that goes from trillions down to 160. When the size of a pack is a power of two, it gives a dramatically smaller shuffle group. Hmm, that's incredible. So what exactly is happening when the size of the pack is a power of two? Well, the answer comes down to this mathematical object that we've been talking about, groups. A mathematical group is a particular type of structure that's found throughout maths and actually throughout lots of other areas outside of maths. And mathematicians study finite groups by breaking them down into building blocks. So just like any whole number can be written as a product of prime numbers, making primes the building blocks of whole numbers, any finite group can be built from special groups called the simple groups. For most of the shuffle groups, their associated simple groups are really big, meaning the shuffle groups themselves are enormous, as we talked about before. But for the power case, when the size of the pack is a power of two, the only building blocks involved in the groups are particularly small simple groups called the cyclic groups, which means that the size of these shuffle groups is dramatically smaller. It turns out a similar power case result is true for something called many-handed perfect shuffles, which Cheryl investigated with her colleagues Carmen Amara and Luke Morgan in 2019. When Carmen and Luke were visiting with Cheryl's research group, she remembered a piece of paper covered in data from long ago hidden at the bottom of a drawer and realised that now was a good chance to finally investigate it. I had a piece of paper, as you you mentioned, with a lot of data on it from experiments, computer experiments, conducted by Kent Morrison and John Cannon in the 80s. And it had been sitting in my drawer for decades. And I had always thought that it would be nice to have an opportunity to explore what was happening there. It seemed to be looking at um, a many-handed shuffler. I mean, someone who had these cards, maybe instead of dividing up the pack of cards into two equal packs, two equal piles, maybe into three equal piles, and then um, pretending that you had your three hands and so you could pick up one card at the top from each of the three packs and then go on with the second card from the tops of the three piles, etc. So it would be as if you, well, as if you had your um, three hands and you could do these uh, perfect shuffle. 
So you can think of our normal perfect shuffles where the puck is split into two equal piles as a two-handed perfect shuffle. And it gives you two possible shuffles, one where you start taking cards from the top half of the pile, the out shuffle, and one where you start taking cards from the bottom half of the pile, the in shuffle. Then you could do as Cheryl and her colleagues did. You could imagine you have more than two hands and you split your puck into three, four or more equal sized piles. So the next question is, what would a perfect shuffle look like for these many-handed players? So if you have three piles, you could choose the top third pile for the first card, but then do you take the second card from the middle third pile or the bottom third pile? And what if you started with taking the top card from the middle third pile or the bottom? Now there are lots more possibilities for perfect shuffles, and you need to decide what counts as a perfect shuffle for these many-handed shufflers and how you're going to describe these different types of perfect shuffles. Kent Morrison, one of the people that got this data, had written a, um, a lovely article about it in the 70s where um, he suggested that perhaps you could have any number of piles, of equal sized piles of cards. And, um, and then it wasn't clear what you should be doing with them. So you, you <laughs> divide up your piles of cards into K, K sub piles and then what? You can pick up the cards, as I said, that might be like an out shuffle. But what if you decided to start with a with the second pile and then go to the seventh and then the 15th and then the, the 27th pile um, to, to work out in what order you would pick, the, pick up the, the cards to complete your shuffle? Um, and so Kent decided in his work that um, he would allow any choices of the order in which you would pick up from the piles of cards. So this is actually a great example of how mathematicians often work. In this case, they started with perfect shuffles arising from standard card games, where the deck is split into two equal piles with two types of perfect shuffles, the in and the out shuffle. And then, after exploring the maths of that setting, they generalized the setup to see how far these results can be extended. They generalized to splitting the puck into three, four or more equal piles. In fact, they considered the arbitrary case of any number of piles, of k equal piles. But what does a perfect shuffle look like in this generalized case? In the original perfect shuffle, you either started with the top pile and alternator cards or with the bottom pile, giving you two types of perfect shuffles as we've said. Cheryl and her colleagues decided to think about a many-handed shuffle in a new way. They considered not only how many piles you split the pack into, but also the order of the piles that you use to determine the way you are alternating the cards in your shuffle. Say I split my pack into three piles. I could do a perfect shuffle using the top third, then a card from the middle third, then a card from the bottom third. That's one type of many-handed perfect shuffle described in terms of how we order the piles top, middle, bottom. I could have started with the top third pile, then taken a card from the bottom pile and then the middle pile. So top, bottom, middle, that's a different order of piles defining a different type of many-handed perfect shuffle. With this new approach, describing your perfect shuffles by the order of piles you used, Cheryl, Carmen and Luke proved in some cases something that had been suspected that something similar to the power case happened in this many-handed shuffling. In my work with um, Carmen and Luke, later on when we were splitting the uh, cards up into, say, K piles of length N, um, we, we observed a, um, that there's a similar uh, special case when uh, the size of the pile is a power of the number of piles. So it's like the size of the cards in the in the standard case being a power of two and so again in that case you got a very very small shuffle group. So were they able to prove that this always happens for the power case? That if the size of your pack of cards is a power of the number of piles you always get a much smaller shuffle group? Well thanks to their new approach they've certainly got a lot further in answering that question. When they considered the way you ordered the piles when shuffling your pack Cheryl, Carmen and Luke were able to prove that a giant shuffle group resulted for quite a lot of cases when it wasn't the power case. 
But the most general proof of this power case for many handed shufflers is still open. Their new methods also discovered some other fascinating new results. And as is often the case with maths, their work brought them many questions that remain to be answered. So that's the sound of Will again, doing a perfect shuffle. But here's him doing an imperfect shuffle. See if you can hear the difference. Well, maybe it's because I know it's an imperfect shuffle, but it did sound slightly more irregular and random to me. Well, an imperfect shuffle is just a normal everyday shuffle, really, rather than exactly alternating the cards one, 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 one. The mix between the cards is, as you kind of noticed, is a bit more random. And in many ways, this is a more useful shuffle, as Will explains. I suppose an imperfect shuffle is sort of the best shuffle possible, and because a shuffle's real purpose is to try and mix up cards in a random fashion. Uh, and so an imperfect shuffle, what a shuffle is designed for, uh, is sort of aiming for an optimum mix of the cards. Uh, and so if you were doing uh, an in-the-hand shuffle, the kind of thing that this perfect shuffle is trying to simulate, uh, when you shuffle the cards, you'd be aiming for roughly half and half, but you certainly wouldn't be hitting precisely half and half. Uh, and then when you mix the cards together, you'd be making sure that what used to be the top and the bottom cards change. Uh, and you also, when you're going through the cards, uh, you'll be able to see at least on camera, uh, if you were here with me, you'd be able to see as well, they're not alternating perfectly one, one, one all the way down. You've got some individual ones, some clumps of two, some clumps of three. Uh, and that randomness in how the cards are interweaving from the two halves is the thing that makes it a fair shuffle uh, rather than a precisely controlled one. And mathematically, imperfect shuffles are pretty interesting too, and they're also very important in the gambling world. Percy Day Conus, the mathematician Shara mentioned before, also investigated how imperfect shuffling can produce random orderings of packs of cards. Percy Diaconis, who's a statistician as well as a very, very good magician, uh, did an amount of work on the optimum number of shuffles to mix a deck of cards randomly. Uh, and he sort of developed a, a procedure, uh, which was that you would undercut about a third of the deck. So a third of the deck gets cut from the bottom of the deck to the top. Uh, you then split the cards in half, approximately, not exactly. Uh, and then you give them a riffle shuffle mixing the halves together. Uh, it's not a, a perfect shuffle. It's not that one, 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 one. Uh, it's one where you've got sometimes single cards, sometimes two, sometimes threes, and they get pushed together. Uh, and then if you repeat that cycle uh, of undercutting a third, cutting in the middle, and then giving a riffle shuffle seven times, that's supposed to give you the best balance between number of shuffles performed uh, and the impact that has on destroying the orders that can be located within the pack at the end of the process. We asked Will if this mathematical understanding of shuffling is useful in practice, say in a casino. He said each casino has its standard process of shuffling the cards, but this process has to balance the randomness with the amount of bets that they can get out of their customers. The fairer the shuffle is, the better for the casino, uh, because the more they will be able to take advantage of their mathematical um, edge in terms of the way the game plays out, and they'll win more than the player does. However, every time you're shuffling cards, you're not playing with people. Uh, and if they have a gaming table and nobody's playing at it, then they're not going to be making any money out of it. So you get a, a compromise, I suppose, between trying to make sure that the game is as fair as possible so that their statistical edge means they'll win the amount they should win, but also trying to make sure that as much time as possible is spent playing at the table rather than mixing the cards up. Uh, and I don't think there's a standard. I think every casino comes to their own choice as to where they fall uh, in that balance. Now, Will is not your average magician. As well as astounding people with tricks like these, he also uses magic to help people, in particular to help people communicate. His PhD in the history of magic highlighted some of the non-magical skills that learning and performing magic can teach you. Yeah. Now, Will is magician in residence at Imperial College and is investigating how these transferable skills from magic can be used in some surprising settings. Uh, as part of that, I've been working with uh, Professor Roger Kneebone at Imperial College uh, for a number of years now. Uh, he is a surgeon and professor of surgical education. Uh, and so I've been working with him in the School of Medicine, uh, looking at how skills that magicians have and approaches that magicians take to things could be useful in a medical context. 
Uh, so a lot of our work at the moment is looking at patient doctor interactions uh, as sort of performances for a very small audience uh, where things have to be developed in a, a clear way over a short period of time. You have to build rapport quickly. You have to make sure people take away the right recollections of what's happened uh, to act on it later. Uh, and there's lots of parallels between that uh, and magic. Uh, obviously, magic is a little bit deceptive. Medicine is not. Magic is entertainment. Medicine is not. But the underlying skills that are used to develop those things uh, can be transferred. Now we come to the part of the podcast where we try to explain some maths in one minute. But this time we're going to do something a tiny bit different. We're very excited as this is our very first podcast produced as part of our new collaboration with the Isaac Newton Institute, otherwise known as the INI. And that's where we watched Cheryl's lecture on the maths of shuffling. Cheryl was at the INI attending one of their research programs on groups, representations and applications. And we've produced a collection of articles covering the maths they discussed in that program. You can find it all at plus.maths.org if you search for symmetry. To celebrate this new collaboration, we thought we'd ask Dan Aspel, the communications manager for the INI, to tell us all about the Isaac Newton Institute in just one minute. The Isaac Newton Institute uh, is an international research centre for the mathematical sciences and and that means that although it's based in Cambridge and it's part of the University of Cambridge, it plays host to up to two and a half thousand visiting academics throughout a year and they may be mathematicians, they may be people in uh, related fields that have a mathematical element to them. They will take part in programmes which are large group meetings of people which can last anywhere between uh, a month and six months and in that time they'll do a lot of collaborative work that's kind of the focus of INI is that these are bringing together these programs are bringing together people from across the world who have shared specialties and they might be quite esoteric and they are getting a chance to be completely isolated away from all the other responsibilities in life and to just focus on pushing forward the science in a particular topic And within that program, they're going to have workshops. There may be one a month, there may be one every two months. And these will be week-long, really intense periods where 150 people will be in the main seminar room and they'll come from all over the world as well. So you'll get a lot of other input from people who aren't necessarily on the program, but who have taken the time to come for that week. Obviously, in the current pandemic situation, they'll be taking part virtually uh, at the moment. Uh, So we don't have the full building that we used to. But events are going to be both physical, hybrid and and virtual from this point onwards, which is, I guess, an exciting consequence of the pandemic. So to summarise, really, the Isaac Newton Institute is a unique space in the world where the mathematical sciences are driven forward by the best minds. Excellent description, Dan. Now, PLUS lives just next door to the Isaac Newton Institute, and we've been lucky enough to visit it over the years. And it's a really exciting and unique place. We asked Dan to tell us what he thought makes it so special. I think it's the uh, atmosphere when the place is full and when there's an event which people are excited about. I think it doesn't matter what subject you're uh, covering, let's say. It's just an amazing celebratory atmosphere And there's a sense that things are happening which in years to come will be regarded as significant. We really agree with Dan. It's so exciting to be at the Isaac Newton Institute when a programme's going on and there's all these mathematicians really excited about the work that they're doing. And it's also been the site of some phenomenal moments in mathematics such as the announcement of Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem, which you can read about on PLUS. Um, Thanks very much to Dan for telling us all about the Isaac Newton Institute. Well, that's all we've got time for in this podcast. You can read much more on Plus about groups and about the maths and magic of shuffling, including much more information from Cheryl and Will. And you can even learn some magic tricks. Visit plus.maths.org and search for shuffling. Thanks for listening and bye bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.